members of the board, members of the scientific council, authorities, faculty, alumni, students, friends, welcome to this round table that is organized with the excuse of the uh, meeting of the scientific uh, council. Uh, in the name of our community, that is formed by uh, several universities and uh, that uh, uh, give up big importance to the Barcelona GSC. I want to give a special thanks to the Scientific Council members that participated today in this event. Thank you very much for having accepted. Also to his president, Hugo Sonnenstein. It's very nice having you here. Uh, the, uh, the chair of the Board of Trustee, Paulina Beato. Uh, the honorary president, uh, president, Joaquin Almunia. The founder... I, I, oh, sorry, I was not uh, look, uh, seeing you. The founder of the Barcelona GSC, Andreu Mascolel, and to the director of the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics, Teresa García Mira, who is doing a tremendous job. Uh, the program is very tight, and I will uh, be very short uh, in introducing the participants to the roundtable on what has changed. Each panelist will have a short presentation of about 15 minutes, and then uh, the uh, floor will have all the questions they, they can. Uh, since the speakers are very well known and uh, we want to use the time wisely in uh, listening to them, I will give a very short presentation. Uh, in the order they will intervene is the alphabetical order, the one it is in the program. The first person to intervene will be Professor Orli Asenfelter. He is Professor in Economics and Director of Industrial Relations Section at Princeton, Princeton University. His areas of specialization include labor economics, econometrics, and law and economics. His work has been extremely influential and has led to the systematic development of rigorous methods for the quantitative evaluation of many economic problems, and in particular uh, in labor economics. And he will talk about what has changed with automation in the labor market. Our second speaker is Matt Jackson. He is professor of economics at Stanford University. His research includes uh, many topics in game economics and, uh, and sorry, in game theory and, make, and microeconomic theory and uh, the study of social and economic uh, networks. And he has published a lot of papers in a book that has been very, very influential uh, in the topic. He will talk about what has changed with social network as populist public opinion map. Our third invited speaker is Anne Kruger. She is senior research professor of international economics at the School of Advanced International Studies at the John Hopkins University. She has been the World Bank Chief Economist and the first deputy managing director of the International Monetary Fund. Her field of specialization uh, are the economic of development, international training and finance, and she has made central contributions both for the theory and the practice. She will address the question of what has changed in the international trade environment. Our fourth speaker is Professor Robert Lucas. He is currently a, a John Dewey Distinguished Service Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago. He has received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1995 for having developed and applied the hypothesis of rational expectation and thereby having transformed macroeconomic analysis and deepening our understanding of economic policy. He is widely regarded as a central figure in the development of, macro, of macroeconomics and he will lecture uh, about what has changed in central bank in, uh, with the new uh, monetary and financial st uh, stability policies. And the last speaker will be uh, Professor Edward Prescott. He's currently at the Federal uh, Research Bank of Indianapolis and at Arizona State University. He received the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2004, sharing the award with uh, Finn Kidney for their contribution to dy dy dynamics or macroeconomics, the time consistency of economic policy and the driving forces behind business cycles. His work has been tremendously influent, in particular in modeling all the macroeconomic variables with micro foundations. And he will explain us what has changed with growth, uh, is it slowing down? So the five of them will do the presentation one after the other. The first one is uh, Orly Hasenfer, and you have the floor. Should I sit right here? <laughs> 
<laughs> right. <laughs> well, why not? We'll just sit right here. Yeah. Uh, I have some slides. I'm not sure how that's going to work. Okay. We're going to make sure that they work. Okay. There you are. Are you going to give me the clicker? Oh, fantastic. Yeah, so let's see. What do I do? Make this go. Uh, I don't know. Which. Uh, you put here to the right. Mm -hmm, I did. not do that, though. Oh, I have to wait. <laughs> that just tells you uh, who I am. Um, I'll try to make this discussion informal. Anybody who'd like to see these slides uh, is welcome to them. They're from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They're not very complicated. Um, the, uh, I'd like to start with a very short story uh, about an actual factory that I visited recently, a very good friend of mine. Uh, from days long ago, is the president of a company in Los Angeles, California, that manufactures something dear to the hearts of a lot of people, uh, hot sauce. Uh, he manufactures, uh, it's called El Pato. Uh, it is supposed to be the first American company that started a, a brand that has a Spanish name. And it has, of course, a picture of a duck on it. And it's quite famous in Los Angeles, especially amongst Mexican-American families. Um, I always like to visit his factory. He, he paints the big tanks to look like the cans. Uh, probably the most valuable thing about it is the 11 acres he owns in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, but it's been there a very long time. He makes two and a half million uh, cans of hot sauce each month. Uh, he also makes mustard, which is sold to In-N-Out Burger, a famous New Jersey uh, 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 South, Southern California burger joint, and as well as vinegar. Um, I like to visit also to see what happens in the factory in terms of things like automation and robotics. Um, so the last time I visited and really took a tour was about 10 years ago, and I visited last week. Uh, we have to put a hard hat on and you have to wear something to make sure your hair doesn't fall out into the hot sauce and so on. Uh, so I put on a hairnet and a, uh, uh, a hard hat and a, and a, uh, they finally found a, a, uh, a lab coat big enough for me uh, and I wandered through the factory with him and I didn't notice, uh, uh, I only noticed one thing different in the last 10 years and that was that uh, there was a, they bought an Italian machine that actually would take the cans and as they came out, sort them into a box and, sh and shrink wrap them. The only thing left that I didn't see that was, that was anything that wasn't automated was uh, when those boxes of cans come out, they're then loaded onto a pallet, which is then uh, shipped somewhere. Um, uh, my guess was that his output is up maybe 30% for the same number of workers as it was 10 years ago. That's about 3% a year. Not very different from productivity growth in manufacturing generally. Uh, there weren't any robots, and there had to be someone standing there pretty much for every one of the machines. That hadn't changed at all. So there had been probably a little bit of labor saving uh, with the packing of the cans into the boxes, but uh, not, not more than 30%. And uh, so the, my takeaway from that was the answer to the question, uh, uh, is it works, it's worth a little more investigation and so I just looked at what's happened to the productivity numbers. Um, that, oops, how far did we go? Yeah, there's one. That, that has annualized rates, and then it also has a, uh, uh, annualized four-quarter averages, and then it also has these blocks or actual annual averages. You can see productivity growth has not been very substantial in the U.S. Here's another picture of, of uh, a different measure of productivity that accounts for factor inputs. Uh, and you can see, oh wait, there's that one. Uh, uh, you can see productivity growth has not been any more substantial in the last few years, been less in fact in some areas. Uh, so uh, the point is that there's been productivity growth in the U.S. economy for hundreds of years. And there doesn't seem to be any different about what's going on now. Uh, I, I remember the old quote 
I, I kindly redid it, uh, from Bob Solo. We see robots everywhere, except in the productivity statistics. Um, so I looked a little more carefully at it. I think, so the, I'll give you a simple answer, nothing's changed um, in productivity growth. Uh, there isn't anything. Uh, most of the discussion of big data, I think, is a, big data is mainly used to figure out how to sell you things. So unless the entire GDP is going to be composed of advertising, I don't think there's that much in big data either. It might be helpful for research, but of course, I, people like me doing program evaluation, as you mentioned, I've been using big data for so long that it's hard to even tell, actually, almost 50 years, perhaps. So there, there isn't, I don't think there's anything really new in any of that. Most of it is hype, and certainly nothing in the productivity figures. There is one thing that's changed, <clears throat> and I didn't look at, I looked at this a little more carefully. Change from the time that Bob or Ed or Ann or any of us were in graduate school, maybe not Matt, he's younger. Um, and that is that it used to be uh, just an absolute uh, identity that real wage growth was equal to productivity growth. Uh, I wrote down models in which you know, you close, productivity growth is exogenous, so if you can explain wage growth, you can explain price growth, or however you want to do it. But basically, uh, that was more or less an identity. And of course, that stopped. That's no longer true. And it stopped uh, in the early 1970s. So that productivity growth doesn't equal uh, real wage growth anymore. And I think that's pretty well known. Um, there are, it's a little, un, it's very unclear exactly why that is. Uh, so uh, there's two things uh, at issue. Let me just show you, first of all, the facts. Uh, that's uh, the blue, the dark blue is the uh, productivity growth uh, by sector. So here I try to do it by sector. BLS kindly provides that data. Uh, and then the little light blue is the real wage growth in those sectors. It shouldn't, I mean, what we should expect would be that the light blue numbers would all be sort of the same uh, because any productivity growth in the aggregate economy should presumably result in real wage growth everywhere, not just in those sectors that have more productivity. Uh, and that, that's sort of true, that's not exactly true, uh, and there are other reasons why uh, real wage growth wouldn't be the same in each of those sectors. Um, and of course, productivity growth is dispersed. That's also a Solos point, which he made in an early, early paper, different in different sectors. So uh, the, the fact that this all aggregates together to get productivity equal to real wage growth isn't necessarily a guaranteed fact, and certainly is no longer true. Um, now, there are two reasons to be a little bit suspicious of, oh, let me show you the picture. There's a nice little picture. That's not a regression, by the way. That, the red line is, a, is the, uh, it just goes through the unit point. And so it's just, what it tells you is, uh, if comments, in, yeah, these are all the sectors that they have. Uh, if compensation growth were equal to productivity growth in a sector, uh, all the points would lie on the line. You can see, generally speaking, productivity growth is greater than compensation growth in most sectors. Um, now, there are two, two reasons to be suspicious about this. Um, the first is that when we write down that, uh, by the way, the other thing that's true is, is if, if, I'll explain why it isn't really true, but it's sort of true, is that if productivity growth doesn't equal real wage growth, then labor's share will be changing. Either it becomes bigger or smaller. Uh, when productivity growth is greater than uh, labor share, then, uh, I'm sorry, greater than, than uh, real wage growth, then labor share uh, declines. And that's certainly true in these data. There is a problem with that, however, and the, re the problem is this. Um, output, uh, real wage growth is, the, the, the price deflator for real wage growth is the consumer price index, is what, cons what workers pay for their stuff. But the price deflator for output, of course, is what producers get when they sell the stuff. So it, it, it turns out that um, you can just think of any decompose, any real wage growth difference into two parts. Uh, a change in labor share, 
share of the output they produce, value of the output they produce, measured at producer prices, and uh, plus the change in the difference in the deflators. So if consumer prices are going up faster than producer prices, then labor share measure, or then, then real wage growth will be uh, uh, less than productivity growth. And likewise, if labor share is going down, then real wage growth, uh, uh, then, then uh, uh, real wages will grow less than, at a slower rate than productivity. Um, so you can actually decompose these sectors and, uh, uh, oh, what in the world is that? Oh, wait, sorry. Well, I was going to, I guess I'll get to that. Oh, yeah, so here's, here's the picture of when you actually do it using uh, real wage growth compared to producer price index. You can see they do fall on the line pretty much. Um, th this is an example of the decomposition. So this is for one sector. Uh, the productivity growth is on the top. The real wage growth measured in uh, CPI numbers and in, in, in consumption prices are in the bottom. Um, and the one in the middle is uh, real wage growth measured in producer prices. So you can see about half of the productivity growth is accounted for by labor's share change, and the other half is accounted for by the difference in these deflators, uh, by the, different, the change in the growth of the deflators. Uh, that's actually the breakdown right there. You can see it varies all over the place. Uh, light blue is uh, uh, the component which is accounted for by the difference in the growth of the deflators, and you can see it's, it's a, about half. Roughly speaking, people think half of the, the gap between uh, real wage growth and productivity growth is due to uh, differences in the growth in deflators. Uh, that has changed slightly. I'll give you one more picture. Uh, so that labor in the latter half of the period that we were looking at earlier from 85 to 2015, uh, in the latter half, more of it is attributable to labor's share declining. Now let me just take, and, and then I'll open to anybody that wants to talk about it later, uh, open this to a, wh why is this? Uh, one interpretation, Paul Krugman, for example, is that uh, labor share has declined uh, because uh, the bargaining power of labor has, has decreased. Um, actually, that's a, a, a topic that I've been working on recently. Uh, it is true that the Americans are not very um, pro-labor. So we have seen some, uh, we now have seen several very explicit examples of collusion amongst employers to suppress wages. This was done in Silicon Valley. Steve Jobs, you probably heard of him, and George Lucas got together to suppress wages in the animation industry. We know that's a fact. Jobs admitted it. Um, and there are some other examples. Some of them are a little bit more complex than you realize. For example, uh, in a fran franchise company, uh, a McDonald's uh, in in uh, in uh, New York is not supposed to hire anybody from another McDonald's. They actually have it written into their franchise agreement. They won't do that. Um, it's, it's unclear the legality of that, but it has been going on for at least 30 years. So uh, there are some, there is a sense in which you can actually point to facts that are related to uh, failures of competition in the labor market. Of course, there are the other obvious facts. One is that we don't really have trade unions anymore in the private sector. Uh, they're, at, they're at well below 7% uh, unionized, which would be quite different for most of Europe, and even Canada, for that matter. Uh, so there are lots of symptoms of, of lessened uh, competition. Uh, there are other explanations. Uh, capital, for example. Uh, maybe we don't have as much capital as we think because depreciation has increased. Uh, everybody wants me to get a new computer every five I still use a Blackberry. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will challenge anybody in this room to type a message as fast as I can on my Blackberry. There has been no productivity growth <laughs> with the use of iPhones at all. Uh, the, uh, so so I, we don't know for sure. May, maybe uh, there really isn't as, as it, it, we have to spend a lot more on capital in order to keep it going because depreciation has changed. And then there's the question of the deflators. And I, frankly, I was, I was surprised by that to see such long-term gaps in the input price deflator and the consumer price deflator. Obviously, uh, when uh, 
I was studying economics, that was not true. Those deflators must have been growing at the same rates. Uh, that's why we saw productivity growth equal to real wage growth. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case now. One interpretation is that the CPI's measurement, that the way the, the, way the producer prices are set up, it's virtually impossible to measure some of the things that people who consume take for granted as being important. I don't mean just things like housing, uh, where you can argue about the best way to deal with a price deflator for housing, but also things like medical care, which are ex very, a, a substantially rising fraction of expenditures uh, in the US, and especially in this crowd. <laughs> None of us being really young. Um, and uh, so it may be that's one of the reasons for the gap, in which case that thinking of labor share the way we used to is probably not really as appropriate as it used to be. Okay. Oh, by the way, the bottom line then is uh, what's the big change in robots and automation? And the answer is <laughs> there isn't any. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about changes in human connectedness and what kinds of implications that's having. And I'm, I'm going to focus on three trends. And one is just basic globalization and densification. So the networks that we have are, are getting denser. Hopefully slides will be popping up soon. Yeah. Let's see, there we go. Okay. Um, so then uh, the second trend is that, that the connectedness that we have and the internet are allowing us to become more segmented than we were before. And so that the societies are actually breaking into uh, more cliquish groups than before. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some evidence for that and, and also what its implications are and for polarization and, and other things. And then I want to end with just some, some comments on how the internet is changing news production and in particular how the fact that news can be spread so quickly and repackaged so quickly is changing the incentives for people to do deep investigative reporting and some worries about that uh, for democracy. So the, the first thing I'll start with is just you know, basic trends and, and, and basically really good news. Um, so the, let's see if this is the right, it just does move quickly. Okay, so the, the first one is, is one that Anne's going to talk about in more detail, and this is just looking at the world trade figures over uh, a little more than the last century, and there's been an enormous growth since the Second World War and since the 1950s, where we've gone from roughly 20% to more than 60% in terms of, of GDP, uh, imports and imports imports and exports over GDP. So there's been a, a huge growth in international trade, and that's been accompanied by a dramatic decrease in the number of wars in the world. So this is a plot of the number of wars per country, per pair of countries, um, from the, the Napoleonic period, going back to just after the Napoleonic Wars up through the present. And what I've, I've sort of circled in that red dot at the, at the end is what's been happening since the 1950s. And if you look at the data carefully, this is from a study I did with Stephen Nye, the, the number of wars has dropped by more, more or less a factor of 10 um, from if you go before 1950 to post-1950. And it, you can measure wars in different ways. You can get it from a factor of 5 to a factor of 10, depending on what kind of conflicts you're using and whether you're measuring it by deaths or, or uh, mobilization, etc. But the, the number has dropped dramatically. And the numbers correspond very closely with trade. So if you look at the correlation, when, once two countries trade more than a certain percentage of their GDP, they basically just do not go to war with each other anymore. And uh, the, the data are, are, are quite striking in terms of the strong correlation between trade patterns and the absence of war. And when you look at most of the wars that still exist in the world, the Great Congo Wars in Africa were probably the most deadly in the last couple of decades, um, ongoing conflicts in a lot of, of, of the world, are ones where there's, there, there's basically absent trading relationships. And, and that you know, it is, is something that is quite disturbing when you start looking at things like Brexit and uh, current uh, trade negotiations that are going on. But the, the good news is sort of you know, these things are, are dramatically improving. It's also made a huge difference in 
uh, the poverty rate around the world. So this is just looking at the, the percentage of the world that lives below the poverty line. In 1980, that was more than 40%. Now it's less than 10%. So the, you know, the, the, the world has improved in a lot of ways, and that part of that is due to, to trade and foreign investment. So if you look at foreign direct investment in a lot of countries, especially India and China, um, roughly in, in uh, 2000, there was about $26 trillion flowing between countries. Now it's about 100, over $130 trillion um, out of about $300 trillion uh, that flows between countries. So the, the, the investment that's going across country borders is, is enormous. And that, that's really integrated the world on a new level. Um, associated, uh, uh, along with these sort of technological changes in, in trade that have changed things, there's also been the internet, which has grown up. And now it's remarkable to think about how rapidly this has happened. This has happened in, in more or less uh, the last 10 to 15 years. But this is just looking at the, per, the number of monthly active users in different internet platforms. So Facebook is over 2 billion. WeChat's over a billion. You can look here, you know, YouTube, um, WhatsApp, uh, QQ, QZone. There's a whole series in China. Uh, but the, the sheer number of people that are connecting in these ways is enormous. And um, what I want to say uh, in, in sort of the second trend is this is changing the way people connect. And, and one part of the good news about this is that people are connected around the world much more than they're able to before. And that is that helping a lot of people in, in having access to information, access to, to courses online, all sorts of things that, that weren't available before. Um, but at the same time, it's also changing the structure of these networks. And so if I can get this, whoops. There we go. Um, so there's, there's a, a tendency for people, which is to connect with other people who are very similar to themselves. And that's known as homophily. And what I've done is put up a picture here, which is just illustrative of this kind of phenomenon. What this is is a social network. And this is from a study I did with Sergio Curarini and Paolo Pin. This is a network of high school students. And this is a US high school. These are color coded by race. So each dot is a student, and there's a connection between two students if they're friends together. And I didn't place the dots on the picture. What the, the way that they're separated was by an algorithm. And the algorithm tries to push people together if they're friends and pull them apart if they're not friends. The blue dots are black students. The yellow dots are white students. And the red dots are Hispanic students. And you can begin to see that even though this is a high school that was very integrated on paper, it's completely segregated when you get inside the friendship patterns, right? So, so here, students are 15 times more likely to be friends with somebody of their own race than to be friends across races. So this kind of tendency, you know, here you see it racially in a US high school, but it exists on all sorts of dimensions. It exists by religion, profession, age, gender, you sort of name it any way you cut human networks, people tend to, to seek out other people who are similar to themselves and associate with people who are similar to themselves. Um, one thing that's happening because of the internet is that that's tending to increase. And it increases for two reasons. One is that you can connect to more people so you can look around the world and find people who are similar to yourselves. And the other is that algorithms are built to suggest things to you. And it suggests things in two ways. One is it looks for what you like and it tries to feed you things you like. And the other is that it connects people to you through your existing friends. So if you're already friends with somebody, it'll suggest those people's friends as new friends. And so as your network grows, it tends to grow with people who are, are similar to you. So this sort of reinforces itself and produces um, networks that are very introspective and, and more segregated than, than they ever have been. Now, in terms of measuring this, it's somewhat difficult, but uh, you know, one one set of studies are a set of studies that look at when internet came into certain areas and then looks at po political polarization depending on that rollout and tries to look at random, random elements of, of internet changes in different areas. Um, so for instance, Anya uh, Prumer has looked at internet availability in the US and she, her, her estimates were that once internet came into a given area, there was a 22% increase in the political polarization in terms of the, the uh, change in attitudes politically um, after the internet came into those areas. So there's some evidence that that actually uh, helps exacerbate this kind of structure. Um, my own 
colleague, Matt Jenskow, who's done work with Jesse Shapiro and Matt Taddy, sort of looking at, at political polarization and speech and, and found that that has increased um, dramatically uh, since the, the 1990s, basically. Um, and, and one way they do that is by natural language processing. So they try and look at speeches, and then what they, you do is listen to a little bit of a politician's speech, and then try and see, just based on the words in that speech, could you guess what their political party was? And uh, bef before 1990, out of a f it, it, after you'd listened to four minutes, you had about a 65% chance of predicting the person's party correctly. Now you have about a 95% chance of, of predicting their, their party correctly. So the, you know, the speech is becoming more polarized. There's evidence that this is increasing uh, on, on a variety of dimensions. Um, one difficulty with that is that humans tend to be pretty poor at tracing information. And so, for instance, if I hear information from, say, four different colleagues, it could be that they all heard it from the same source. And I count that as four independent pieces of information, even though it's actually traced back to one piece of information. This kind of double counting is something that shows up experimentally. And when we look at what this does to social learning, it means that we reinforce our views. And when we put that together with this sort of homophily, these segregation structures and networks, that ends up uh, producing polarized views. And, and so I think that that's one danger that's going on. OK, the last thing I wanted to mention was sort of how the internet is changing news production. And as I mentioned, the, you know, the sort of good news about this is it gives everybody in the world a microphone. Anybody can post a video on YouTube. Anybody can post whatever they want on the internet and make it widely available. So there's, at some level, it's very liberating and very equalizing. But at the same time, the fact that uh, a news story, which is broken by a major uh, news service which spent years investigating something, can then be reposted by somebody else or repackaged in a way that says, as reported by the New York Times or as reported by Vanguardia. So, so instead of the, the original story, it's just quoted and, and repackaged. And that is, is changing the incentives for people to invest in, in investigative reporting. Um, estimates, for instance, if you look at US news newspapers, television, magazines, and other things, the number of people employed in news uh, services actually doing investigative reporting has dropped by more or less a factor of, of a half. So in the US, in 2000, there were roughly 57,000 people employed in this, and now there's less than uh, 30,000 um, television networks. It's, it's, so part of this is there's a, a changing news landscape, and the good news is that there's a lot more information out there the, the, the bad news is that it's not necessarily as careful and deep as it used to be. And I think we need to, to be thinking carefully about what the incentives in a new world are to be producing news and, and who's going to be doing that producing. And then also, uh, ultimately, how it's, it's consumed. There's actually a, a, a wonderful quote by um, David Simon, who was the creator of The Wire. He, he was actually a, a Baltimore Sun reporter for years. And in a Senate hearing, he said, it's going to be one of the great times to be a corrupt politician. Um, so I think, you know, this is the, the news production is, is sort of a cornerstone for democracy. And, and that's something that we need to worry about in terms of the new age of, of the Internet. Um, so I think I'll stop there and pass it to over. Thank you. I don't need this. Okay. <clears throat> I've got the most unhappy topic, I think, of the lot uh, for today on uh, the future of U.S. trade. Uh, let me start with a couple of background comments which lead into it, the first of which is uh, that after World War II, I was always very proud of my country because it led to a system of open multilateral trade. It did not take the usual victor's stance and demand reparations, but instead tried to build a world of an open multilateral trading system, open multilateral financial system through the IMF, and of course even funds for development with the World Bank. Uh, the principles of the World Trade Organization, which I am the one going to focus on because it's important for trade, are first off no discrimination between countries. Once something is coming from abroad, you treat everybody the same way. Secondly, that there's national treatment of anybody within a country, so if you export to the United States and some importer takes you to court in the U.S., you will be treated in the U.S. the same as the national will be treated. No difference for national treatment, and that's important. And the third is really the rule of law, which covers things like tariffs only, because they're 
something that you can measure. They're, trans, they're transparent. Uh, it covers things like uh, how, how you will deal with various issues in trade. Uh, there are rules, for example, under cir of circumstances under which it's possible to say, okay, we have standards on uh, what the uh, health standards for uh, fruit imports should be. Uh, well, we have it, and there has to be a scientific test saying that makes some sense. And by the way, that's still an argument between Europe and the United States, because American scientists say there's no proof that GMO is bad, and the European scientists say there's no proof yet that it's good. So we have a debate there as to which way it is, and that's one of the things, but it's within the rule of law, and that's the way it goes. And there is, and I'll come back to this because it's important, a dispute settlement mechanism which within the, I, within the WTO, that I think most people knowing anything about trade would agree has been a huge success in the world economy in preventing trade disputes and so on and so forth. And I will come back to it because it's under threat at the moment. The open trading system has served the world very well. Uh, it opened up uh, greatly after World War II. At that time, transport and communi communication still took forever. Uh, transport costs were still estimated about 25% of the value of international shipments. <clears throat> and uh, the average tariff rate on manufactured goods was about 50% among the advanced countries. It was even worse than the developing countries. Uh, since that time, trade has opened up in a variety of ways. Uh, the rate of growth of exports worldwide of goods and services has been about double that of real GDP until the past few years, and that could be cyclical because it fluctuates a bit. And on top of that, the developing countries began opening up so that they became more important to the system. And importantly, it, it, there's really no country that was a poor country after World War II in the Western world that has grown without opening up its trading system over a very long period. You could discover oil or something like that and get a few good years growth, but that's about it. Otherwise, opening up has been essential for the growth of those countries and important, therefore, for the world. In the period since World War II, as I said, the tariffs among the industrial countries, which applied to all imports from everywhere, of manufacturers fell from about 50% to 3%. Transport costs fell from about 20% on average to about 7%, okay? So the barrier between countries went way down, and that was one of the factors accounting for the growth of trade, which was an engine for growth of the international economy big time. Uh, the trade volume, of course, grew enormously during that period. Now, the European Union was an exception in the sense that it uh, was not open, multilateral, non-discriminatory, and there is provision within the WTO, earlier the GATT, for a preferential trading arrangement providing that it applies to everything so some tariffs are, and the exact legal wording is substantially zero on all goods imported. Uh, secondly, uh, that uh, there, it has to be, if you agree on uh, a preferential arrangement, all tariffs must be dropped to zero on a specified date. You cannot say we will drop them someday. It has to be done on a specific day. And thirdly, uh, basically, it has to be one uh, where it's uniform across the countries within and from, without. If it's a customs unit, it has to be prep, the same tariffs without, if it's free trade area, only the same tariffs, uh, no tariffs for the members within, but different tariffs without. And that gets important for some things, but I won't go into that here. The European Union was an exception, and for a while, everybody said, look, the EU is a customs union. They're doing so wonderfully. Customs unions must work. Well, the Latin American free trade agreement started uh, the Euro Africans started several, none of them worked. What was the difference? Well, the first and big difference was that the European Union dropped its tariffs internationally from an average of about 50% to three, and it dropped its tariffs internally from 50% to zero. So it was a difference between a drop of six, uh, six, you know, all the way with only leading six percent. So which worked? Was it the internal or the external liberalization? Of course it was both. And much of what happened in Europe was because of other things like a mutual recognition of standards and so on, as well as the basic, uh, w basic premise. But on the other hand, even the EU was opening up to external trade. At the same time, it was opening up to internal trade a bit more. Okay? So that's important for understanding a lot of what's going on. There were multi successive multilateral rounds of tariff negotiations for reductions which only the advanced countries really participated in until 1980, giving the developing countries free rider status because they got the benefit of the tariff reductions uh, without giving many. So everybody says that's free rider. I say the opposite. They lost out because they did not reduce their tariffs, but that's a story for another day. 
Uh, and with that, uh, the, the tariff multilateral tariff reduction was what did it for the, develop, the advanced countries. Developing countries didn't do that. But starting about 1980, they began realizing after Korea, Taiwan, and some others had done so well by getting rid of their external barriers, uh, they began cutting down their tariffs and, and removing most of their import quotas, which were even worse, unilaterally. And the big reduction since the 1980s in trade restrictions worldwide has been among the developed co developing countries that have indeed uh, reduced their so without the benefit of a WTO agreement. They have not gotten the reciprocity, which is perhaps OK, perhaps not, but it's just a fact of life. Doha around was more complicated. It started, as you know, around 2002. Uh, it was complicated even getting it going, and it was complicated afterward. And there are a number of reasons, one of which is tariffs were already so low that they were no longer the object, tariffs on goods. Agriculture was an object, and there was a small start on getting some constraints on what you could do to protect agriculture under the Uruguay round. And there would have been more under the Doha round, but that was never completed. Well, the main reason the Doha round wasn't completed was because, of course, the big gains to be had in addition to agriculture were probably in services and in going to non-border restrictions such, such as different regulatory requirements for the same commodity and things like that, which are much tougher to negotiate internationally. And nonetheless, the international multilateral trading system kept going. And indeed, until about 2010, it would have been a reasonable thing to say that the trend had been downward in protection and so on, an increasing integration of goods and services trade in the international economy ever since at least the Second World War. <clears throat> and of course, some before that with transport costs falling and all that. What has changed, of course, is the increasing importance of services over time. You know that in the 21st century, as of now and as of 10 years ago, Liberalizing services trade would have been brought much greater benefits than any further liberalization, mostly for most countries of goods trade. And liberalizing agriculture would have done more, and for a variety of reasons, mostly political in the case of agriculture, they are harder. So the Doha round stalled and basically was abandoned, uh, which was due primarily to complexity. And FT free trade agreements, customs unions became a little bit more the flavor of the month in the hope of breaking through some of these complications. But in 2016, as we all know, uh, the United States, which had led uh, the move toward an open multilateral system and had made some small reverses of policy, but not a lot, got a new president who basically does not seem to agree, to, to believe in any trade at all. Uh, he basically is a protectionist from start to finish. It's about the only thing on which anybody can find any consistency in his ideas over the economic or the political or the geopolitical sphere. And trade has been uh, the victim of that so far, and that is highly unfortunate. And it's clearly uh, the new thing in international trade relations for a variety of reasons. It's the new thing because the US was the leader and really it required some leadership of somebody to keep the WTO going as it was. And that is certainly gone for the moment, big time. Uh, it's, it's, it's new because, in fact, uh, he's done some things that are very harmful to the system. Uh, probably the most harmful is, we won't know until we look later on, of course, but the most harmful is uh, that, as I said, the dispute settlement mechanism of the WTO worked very well. Trade is inherently complicated. When there's a dispute, it's because you required 2.5% ethanol on uh, 90%, whereas we required 2 and 3 quarters percent on 92%. Is that fair? Is that unfair? Is that discrimination? Da, 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 da. And it gets very legal and very complicated very fast. I once taught an undergraduate class for non-majors in international trade. And it was smart kids. They weren't going to go into economics. And I was doing more policy than theory. And about halfway through the class, about, there were about 100 in it, I was surprised, uh, because normally classes weren't that big there at that time. And, and halfway through, about half the class said, then we want to see you separately after class. I said, fine, what do they want? They all wanted to become international trade lawyers. <laughs> Because they found out how much you could do with all of these things. And it's true, it is complicated stuff, which makes it hard to explain. But that said, the dispute settlement mechanism, by almost all accounts, worked very well. It had seven appointed judges who would form panels, or would be formed. And first, there would be basically efforts to resolve the dispute through negotiation, this, that, and the other. Then there would be a decision. And if it was, there was an appeals body, the appellate body was important, so that if you still disputed the decision, you could go there. It was speeded up so it worked more effectively, et cetera. Seven judges. Every panel had to have three. 
Four have had their terms end, end already since President Trump took office. The United States has blocked any new appointments for those four positions. There are three more judges left. Should one of them have to recuse himself for any reason, you can't have a dispute settlement hearing. And meanwhile, two of the three are supposed to, uh, their term ends, and there's no term renewal as of now, as of December this year. By blocking it, that will be, at least for the moment, the end of the dispute me appeals mechanism. And with no appeal, what will happen? The US, by the way, has won something like 88% of the cases it has brought. Uh, other countries have won something like 40%. So if you just looked at who gets more out of it, it is not of uh, the rest of the world. It's the US is one more in its disputes. But that seems to have nothing to do uh, with this blockage. The US has said it doesn't like it, has not said what it has wanted. Uh, the Canadians, the Europeans, and so on have met trying to come up with a proposal they thought would satisfy the US. The US just says that's not satisfactory and keeps on going. Uh, and sad to say, that's sort of the basic approach to trade issues in general. Already we are have steel and aluminum tariffs, as everybody I'm sure here knows. Uh, it is my belief that probably can't stay that way for the obvious reasons. There are some big industries that depend on steel and aluminum inputs, including in particular farm machinery, automobiles, et cetera, et cetera. At the moment, the United States producers of those goods are disadvantaged by our trade system because they pay more for those inputs than the Europeans, the Japanese, the Koreans, and so on and so forth. Uh, and with our free, free trade agreement with China, uh, sorry, with uh, Canada and Mexico, we have kept the tariffs on aluminum and steel for those countries, which makes it even more interesting. So they, too, have higher costs of inputs than the rest of the world. This is amazing. Uh, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, there is to be a tar an announcement by the Trump administration as to what is going to happen in automobiles. And I think the deadline now is May 21st or 19th or something like that uh, for that announcement. I fear uh, that there may be an announcement saying that there has to be something done about that. And so he is going to raise a tariff on autos. Uh, apparently, the report, the report that was required by law has come in. One option is a 25% tariff on automobile vehicle imports into the US. And of course, you can imagine what havoc that will raise in the United States and in the rest of the world. Uh, and it is unfortunately a serious threat. There certainly has been begun to build pressure not to have it. And even some Republican senators uh, uh, in, in Congress have said they will not support this. And it may be something happens, I hope. And in fact, almost the best hope at the moment is that things are so bad uh, that they will have to get better. Uh, but in any event, uh, there is that. <coughs> He dumped, the, he is totally inconsistent, and this makes any forecast as to what will happen almost impossible. The first thing he did in entering office, almost the first thing, but certainly on the first day, he rejected the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, which had been negotiated with 12 Pacific countries, including Japan, Korea, and so on, uh, which would have had a free trade area there, which would have been greatly to everybody's advantage by almost agreement of everybody, and it included a lot of new issues uh, and the new issues are ones in which he complains that are not included in trade agreements. And he wants to negotiate all of those trade agreements bilaterally with the countries that he already had, a, multilaterally. But they've already negotiated a, a free trade agreement among the 11. He now thinks that's unfair because the United States is not included. Uh, it, it makes no sense. It makes no sense uh, at the time when you, think, when you name North Korea as your strategic number one threat, which he did. Then to antagonize the South Koreans by putting 40 quotas on their exports of steel. When their, and the quota rate was set at 70% of the last three years average when their steel exports had been growing during that period. So they had to cut back on exports because there are now quotas. Administration of the quotas is turning out to be another disaster. Uh, there are 54 different kinds of steel on which quotas are imposed. Uh, there are quarterly licensing arrangements under annual licenses. Uh, lots of people, of course, can't plan it that way. And normally, at least from Pacific, uh, Japan and Korea, both of which are exporters, it takes about three months to get something into the US, which makes it absolutely amazing. Uh, there is worse than that to go, and I could go into that in great detail. Uh, but basically, the system there is not working. But once again, we have a mess on our hands. The worst victim is the United States itself, of course. Uh, but the rest of the world, unfortunately, is also uh, victimized by it. <clears throat> And we then, of course, have our so-called trade war with China, which is a trade war. He has already imposed tariffs about, on about $200 billion of imports from China. They're about $500 billion altogether, so about 40% of imports from China are now subject to tariffs. The Chinese have retaliated by putting tariffs, or basically stopping importing some things they were importing, like soybeans. 
Uh, everybody says that's okay because when this is over, things will suddenly he's taking $12 billion of other funds to recompensate soybean farmers in the U.S. because, of course, the price of soybeans in the U.S. fell, not surprisingly, as a result of this. Meanwhile, the Chinese have signed long-term contracts for soybean imports from Brazil and Argentina and other places. So it is very unlikely that all that business would return, even if something happened. But the soybean farmers in southern Ohio still seem to think he's wonderful. He's a businessman. He knows what he's doing, and we're waiting. Don't tell me why they think that, but that's what they think, and that's what the polls show. So <clears throat> we have a mess on our hands internationally in the trading system, led by the U.S., uh, which is in itself uh, dangerous. President Trump is supposed, what well, was supposed to meet by the end of March with the Chinese with an agreement. Oh, first by December, but then they postponed until March. Now with March, he's postponed until the end of April. It's almost impossible for the Chinese to do what he says he wants, because what he wants is them to reduce their trade deficit with the United States <coughs> to zero. Their trade deficit with the United States, of course, is large. Uh, but the United States trade deficit with almost everybody is large. And that's because the trade, I'm saying trade, trade, but I mean current account. He doesn't, he means trade. Uh, but I, I mean current account when I say it, but I'll just say trade for shorthand. Uh, what he, he says, it's unfair for anybody else to have a trade balance uh, which is negative for the U.S. We're supposed to balance trade bilaterally with everybody. Uh, well, of course, what's going to happen is that is even if he gets something with China, and even if they could do it, and cutting your imports from the United States, even for China, would be a big deal to cut them that much. But even if they could do it, other things are going to happen. Like Brazil took the soybeans. Uh, you think that we're not? That other countries aren't going to be doing some of the things and eating the U.S. lunch in some of these regards? Of course it is. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt about it that that's what's going to happen if he gets his way. But meanwhile, how the Chinese can do it, there's only one way. They can order their state enterprises to buy goods from the U.S. whether those enterprises want to or not. But a second condition is he wants to cut the power of the state enterprises. And they're supposed to do less. How do you do both? Meanwhile, he says he, he has to get exports from the United States up. He has criticized harshly things like the closing of a GM plant and so on and so forth. And he's beginning to get into the micromanagement of economics, which we always thought in the United States couldn't happen. And one of the problems with trade is you can favor individual companies. And unfortunately, he has tried to do it. There is now some pushback. GM just announced it the other day that they will not do anything to a plant, uh, which they have announced would be closed and which he has said should not be closed. So that's happening. So there are all kinds of things like that going on. And the closer you look at it in the United States, and the closer you are to it, the worse it looks. It is not something that is something only from Europe. And in fact, I would venture to guess uh, that the biggest damage, if this continues very long at all, will be to see a continued reduction in productivity growth for reasons other than we talked about already. Uh, there's something else going on here. And it is very bad. He's blocked the dispute settlement mechanism, as I said. Uh, there are inconsistencies everywhere. The steel thing is inconsistent between countries. He's tripping over himself between things he has agreed with in the NAFTA, uh, the new NAFTA, which is something called something else which I can't pronounce. Uh, U U.S., Mexico, Canada, USMCA. You tell me how to pronounce that, and I'll do it, but I can't. So I'll call it NAFTA. Anyway, it's unchanged except for raising rules of origin in Mexico for autos. Guess what the new rule of origin is? Oh, I should tell you first. The Mexican average hourly wage at manufacturing is $4 an hour. In the US, it's 21. <clears throat> His condition for Mexico getting into the free trade agreement with the United States is that the average wage paid has to be $16 an hour minimum, four times the minimum wage, and well, of course, above anything that can possibly be afforded. Now, there is only a 2.5% tariff on tariffs and the Mexicans will surely, if that's the case, import under the non-free trade agreement, namely the 2.5%, right? Why do I think there's going to be an auto tariff? Can you guess? Uh, makes sense, I think. And it's, the trouble is, the making sense is not something he's good at, so maybe he won't do what makes sense, which will make the economics worse for the U.S., but better for everybody else. Uh, in other words, to say what's going to happen next in trade is as unpredictable as what he's going to do on anything else, uh, which is bad for business, it's bad for the economy, especially since he does seem to think he can order companies around. And it's, of course, bad for the world. My best hope is that the rest of the world begins to appreciate what was there and perhaps picks up some of the slack and that meanwhile, some of the chaos in the US will be reversed, even because, either because there's such obvious and, and visible uh, dislocation on account of it, or because something happens in the 2020 election. Thank you.
Talk about a tough act to follow. <laughs> we would be more optimistic, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, uh, Ramon got me, had, somebody had to do, do a monetary theory and central banking and, and so on, so he asked me to do it. But, but I, I, I just don't see central banking as a hotbed of brand new ideas, you know? It, it's in, in, I, I want to slide to, uh, this is a, a Angus Madison story, and it runs out too soon because Madison died. Uh, so that's going to cripple my, uh, <clears throat> but I've done this a lot. And you can see the steady growth rate of, of the U.S. and the U.K. <clears throat> they're all growing at the same rate over the same, they're all, <clears throat> and, and, uh, and then in the other countries, France, France, Italy, uh, Japan, after the Second World War, you know, just took off. And all these countries are running exactly the same thing. Now, there's a different level effect here. Uh, I think, I think that the, the U.S. is kind of less, uh, uh, I don't know what to say, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Tries, tries to do less through 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 government uh, relative to these other countries, um, but in terms of growth rates, this growth rate uh, 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 f f for for the successful countries is, is just pretty much a steady goes. It's pretty much a, st a steady rate. Uh, <clears throat> now now we'll go back to the. Okay, now what theorists like to do is to plot uh, uh, against, you know, evidence uh, on a short, short basis. I can't really read this. The, the, I can't. See. What am I doing? I just look at look at the top two. The, the 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 first thing is 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 is, this, is a. You can stand up if you want. Yeah, sure. I don't want Australia. Here, let, let, let's go back. I'm sorry about this. I, oh, no, 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 no! Don't go fast, because I, I can't keep up with you. All right, here we are in the U.S. Okay, what you've got on the on the right, left pa panel is e everything. A very short-term uh, stuff that you're taking, that, uh, and then on the right-hand side, we just ruled out everything, but, but slow-moving uh, stuff. Okay, and, and the, you know, the right thing has easy. You can just read it, and, and, and you know, see World War One, World War Two, and 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 the, and, the, and the U.S. collapse uh, or. Uh, in in the in the in the seventies and eighties, um, so it's a, it kind of makes sense, and you can think about it. But, but the the left is just for the poor guy who has to write a column about the uh, every day about the, the what's going on in the in in in, in these prices. They, I I just don't think there's anything in there. At least uh, Prescott and and and, and, and Kidlin kind of convinced me that there's just, it's just, a, it, it, we just, it is, we just shouldn't be looking at these short-term data, and we should look at, at the longer one. Um, so that's my excuse for not g giving uh, Ramon's uh, talk, but, but, uh, so I want to talk about something else, uh, sort of. Uh, the most interesting development in, in monetary policy and fe the Federal Reserve over my, my, uh, my lifetime ha has been the steady expansion of, of professional economists. Uh, just, we're just getting more and more sophisticated and, 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 the, and the rest of the country is, pay is paying less, more and more to, to what they do. And I just want to talk about, uh, about that. And I think it's, well, I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, 
Now, what did this expansion of professional economists uh, uh, t take off, and, and what, are, what are its consequences? Uh, you could say, you know, anything here. The Roosevelt administration in the 30s uh, just built, built up uh, a, a ton of really amazingly good uh, uh, data that, that we're, we're using, all of us are using all, all the time now, still. Uh, I don't know quite how Roosevelt got into that, or maybe, but, but it, it's a blessing to all of us. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and it made, it made the, the pe people who are economists look, looking at, had look, looked at real data uh, that people in the West, rest of the country just just didn't just didn't have. There was a sophistication there. Uh, in World War II, there was a lot of economists and, of course, other people drawn into into uh, e economics and uh, and uh, many economists found, found that they enjoyed working with policy issues and. And uh, politics, <clears throat> and many other non-economists were impressed with how economists could could tell them stuff that was interesting. Uh, so it was kind of a <clears throat> uh, that uh, that uh, you know they, they kind of realize that you don't. It's not just ha having you don't just have a have to have a law degree in order to be a, 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 a thinker. Uh, <clears throat> I think that this Council of Economic Advisors that came up after the war was kind of a, a way of solidifying this uh, what, what, had, what, what had occurred in, dur during the war. Um, <clears throat> so economists were doing stuff that people, not all of us, but some of some of us. Um, <clears throat> when I was a, I was in in, in, in college then or in my starting at economics, and, and when Kennedy got, we, was elected in 1961, he, 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 all of a sudden he brought a lot of economists that were on my weight reading list and so on. You know, Walter Heller, Keller, uh, Kenneth Arrow, Jim Tobin. These, these people were all of a sudden working in the, or have, having some working in, 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 in the government. Uh, and, and you know, all of us, would, ambitious young kids, we, we, we'd do anything to do it, I mean, I, uh, to have a job like that, or, 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 or at least with those people, or, or, or else uh, us, we'd, 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 uh, we'd want to be invited to do it. Um, now, this process, uh, this. What I've been describing didn't really have that much to do with monetary theory, did it? Uh, and, and the, and the <clears throat> but during the in the 1930s, well, first of all, Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz's picture on the book on on the Federal Reserve System uh, was in 1963, and it was a bombshell, uh, and and they kind of described how how. Uh, how the Federal Reserve managers and you know uh, st stood by and, and let the w w economy drop after 1929 and stay dropped uh, when, according to Friedman and Schwartz, it was pretty easy. And I'll talk about this later. The thing could have been could have been addressed right away, and it just it just w just wasn't. And it wasn't because the people who were doing it didn't know anything about economics. Uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of crazy stuff that was going on during the during the during the thirties, but but it was it wasn't most of it wasn't stuff that made any made any sense at all. Um, so so Friedman and then Meltzer and Bruner, they all kind of got together with other people in in the, in the St. Louis Fed. And that became a good place for, for uh, that's where they invented M1 and M2 and so on. You know, 
students, so you'd ask, ask your students, what, what, what's M1 and what's M2? You know, it's, I think it's been there since, since, uh, since the, I don't know. <clears throat> So anyway, the, the, these guys, the M1, M2 guys, now had a models which had uh, monetary stuff, as well as well as uh, as well as the stuff that uh, that 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 uh, people like like uh, <clears throat> well, Samuelson, Larry Klein, people were doing exciting work, but without anything having to do with monetary theory at all. Uh, <clears throat> so after the 60s, it got, became pretty standard that it, Federal Reserve banks had to, had, to, had to have some really e economists, and they started taking them on. But it, it didn't take, in, in the, the governments really, you think about Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, uh, their heart was in the right place, I suppose, but... but uh, they just di didn't know what what the economics of situations were, and they didn't really ha have anybody, or they had them but didn't listen to them. Uh, uh, so this thing, that whole thing, blew up uh, when Paul Volcker just took over in the in this long expansion. Uh, unnecessary expansion in, in, in the 20, in the 70s and 80s, um, and just knocked it down. Uh, and they reduced the, the 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 growth rate, and it's been steady as you can be. Uh, people are always worried about how. But you look at the data; and it's just kind of. It, it, it's it, these guys don't know what they're doing. Um, so Volcker and, and Alan Greenspan were, were, were pretty much solid citizens. Uh, and then came Bernanke and, and Janet Yellen. Now, 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 these two were established, diminished, <laughs> distinguished e economists before they did anything for, for, the, for the Central Bank or anything. They, they, were, they, they were doing writing papers and... And, and having an influence of, 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 of you know, the, what I call real economists, although I know it's a bit of a snob. Uh, <clears throat> and then it was Bernanke was on duty when Lehman Brothers crashed. This is the, the, there's, only, there's only been one big crash in, in the United States, and that was the, the 30s. Uh, but, but now it looked like, uh, uh, <clears throat> and, and Bernanke had to do something to do about it. And he, what he did, and I just think this is so remarkable. He doesn't th think it is, but but the, the Br Br Lehman Brothers f failed in in, 15, in 1950 in September 15, 2008, uh, and and at that point uh, there was 40 billion dollars in reserves at the in, at, 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 at the federal at the bank. Uh, and Bernanke just kept pouring in money. I, I was, was a, it took a lot of nerve, but he got got into eight from forty billion. He got up to eight hundred billion in, in in by by Christmas by New Year's Day. So this is, uh, and he just kept doing it, and uh, and it worked just like Friedman said it would, would work, and and, and it was like what Ben always said it would work, and then he just did it. And I don't know quite how you must, I mean, you, must, you obviously had a talk, I, I don't know what the inside of it all was, but, but uh, so by the time Barack Obama started, uh, the thing was, there was no crisis anymore. There was no d downturn, no, no, no crash. Uh, now people talk about the trash, the crash, but, but it, it's, it's nothing, I mean, I think uh, maybe Obama w went overboard in, 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 in bailing out people who lost their jobs. But, you know, there's a point to making <laughs> bailing out people who lose their jobs. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a, it's something reasonable people can argue about. Um, but it maintained, uh, it maintained for quite a long time. <clears throat> 
so I think we had to take some pride in, 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 in here are these guys, Yellen and Bernanke, and there are plenty of others too. They, they have different, uh, vote on different sides of the fence, uh, but they somehow work together and, 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 and get stuff done. That's, that, that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's helpful. Uh, so I, I think we ought to be proud of us, uh, or at least Bernanke and Yellen and many other people who are really actively working on it. But, 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 but it's, uh, we're really, I, I hope it lasts because I think it's just a, it's, it's been very good for, 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 it's not everything. I mean, uh, Anna's already talked about, <laughs> but it, this is just the simple, this monetary stuff is just to keep the money, money growing at a reasonable rate. That doesn't have to be, you know, plus two, plus three, plus two, okay, but 45, no. You know, <laughs> that's wrecking your country. And, and the second thing is, it, the, when, 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 when crashes come, and they will crash because that's, that's, that, that's what... What, what, what we get, what we learned from from uh, from uh, well, <clears throat> all I'm saying is, what am I saying? So what I'm going to do is keep the money supply growing at a reasonable rate. Don't worry about day to day up to down stuff, and and uh, and, and when, some, when some crash occurs, do something, and we know what, now what to do, uh, and that's about it. <laughs> you know, I know nothing. I mean, I've never done anything at all like this. <laughs> never. <laughs> and, but you guys will talk about people you admire. <laughs> I'll have no slides. <laughs> First thing, I'm particularly interested in aggregate economics. Aggregate economics is a different science than microeconomic science. Both are powerful and useful sciences. And when I have micro problems, I use micro. I use things like supply and demand. When I do aggregate, I don't. I organize my knowledge about, around aggregate production functions and aggregate um, households. Um, this has led to a unified theory that's been incredibly successful. It's, I call it the, it got called the real business cycle methodology. Yeah, you have money in there and what have you. And we've learned so much, particularly over the last uh, 20 years. You listen to what the people say in Washington and they're still using the language of the 60s, the failed uh, paradigm. Um, a spectacular failure. Now, I want to start off with saying the U.S. has a trade surplus, not a deficit. The U.S. is a big creditor vis-a-vis the rest of the world, not a debtor, as these current, current accounts indicate. The current, current accounts are unbelievable. They say that the, Huge differences on for, the return on investment of foreigners in the U.S. and the U.S. investments abroad. Three versus 9.3. Um, that's too big. The, the German business people are not stupid. And people are, will exploit these opportunities. These accounts say that the U.S. multinationals get 
43% of their profits from the whole, their wholly owned foreign subsidiaries. And, they, and the amount of their assets invested abroad is 13%. American business people are not that dumb. If you're getting that much higher return on investments abroad, invest abroad. Um, my conclusion is, and by the way, these things hold up for 25 years for the period of which data was available at the time it was, the study was car carried out. If, the, if those accounts are unbelievable, what do you need? You need a believable accounts. By the way, I want to emphasize that modern aggregate economics is pretty simple. You can bring smart undergraduates up to that level in one, one senior level course. Um, the basic idea is there's, when you go with more complex problems, you have a few more subscripts on there, but nothing substantial. Well, so therefore I said to the students, we come up with unbelievable accounts. And I told them to say, assume that the world capital markets work and that there is this common return. 4.2% um, was the magic number. That's, um, it didn't matter, wasn't that sensitive to it, but 4% real return has been the return that has characterized for hundreds of years the British councils that used to help finance the wars with France, uh, Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Nurlov, not the one we know, but the, back in the early 20s, we were on a, I mean in the teens of 1900, the insurance companies used 4%. You had a choice of how to take the money. It, and to do this, they used a calculation of 4%. Incidentally, they earned 6% on their investments. And the 2% spread is uh, oh, that financed their operation. Uh, insurance is a big sector. So this 4%, and, and by the way, if you look at the na US national accounts, you look at the corporate profits, net of taxes, and divided by the nominal, nominal value of um, the capital stock of repro reproduction costs. The BEA reports these numbers, and you take that ratio, it's nominal over nominal, so if you mess up on the price level, no problem, <laughs> which is nice, uh, because I don't think we can measure the price level. <laughs> um, 4%. And that's been true with very little fluctuations since the, these accounts, the U.S. national income accounts, came into existence. Um, and a, another thing, year after year, the U.S. has GNP is bigger than GDP. So we have making positive returns on posit what the national accounts or the current accounts say. And how do you earn consistently positive returns as you become a, a big debtor? We, we went through, a, according to the current accounts, it was, it was roughly, um, it was positive up until about 1984, and then it went negative and fell way down. So they, these students did this. Um, it's not, it's not a hard exercise, you just start with the GMP accounts because that's what GMP, not GDP, is what economic theory says to use. Um, the finding was that with this one change, everything started making sense. Needless to say, there weren't any rate of return anomalies by assumption of the accounts. And there's precedents for pe pegging a some interest rate. The precedent is uh, measuring the output of the government sector. 
How did they measure that? They measured the value of inputs. It's easy when you have wages, that part. On the capital, what they do, they, the rental price of capital is a depreciation plus zero nominal interest. Um, so they paid it at zero. So the thing is, what changes, we're not a debtor of minus 0.45 annual GMPs. We're a creditor of 0.9. And consistently, we've had a positive net earnings abroad. And when these people yell and scream about the trade deficit, that's just, uh, it's best to be ignored. Um, it's something politicians have tough jobs and how to keep the special interest groups in check is hard. Um, but, so th this is a one big change. The next thing is, what is the key there? The key there is technology capital or know-how, tech capital. Adam Smith talked about that. Uh, it's teams of people form, that's Ben Holmstrom's language, uh, business enterprises. And they have a lot of specialization. Adam Smith again. Um, in this technology they develop can be used at multiple places throughout the world or within the country. You look at this. Walgreens or um, Costco or what Target or Walmart, every city in the U.S. has it. You don't see, but they have a bunch of them in Mexico too. And uh, they can, this technology can be used abroad. Uh, and virtually all of trade is within the multinationals of goods and, 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 ser and a lot of services. How do you do the accounting with these? What's this technology or know-how that can be used at multiple locations? Theory doesn't say. It's, it's, it's just somewhat arbitrary. But if you sort of look at some of the things, and if you put more in one pot and less in the other, and you're just worried about the total amount, you just, <laughs> the, the error's offset. Uh, that's one of the nice things about aggregate economics. Uh, it's, by the way, how's the U.S. economy doing? The answer is great. Uh, U.S. is becoming more decentralized. Um, as reversing a, a trend towards greater centralization. States are taking more responsibility in communities. The major tax reform, all students of public finance, of the left or right, agree that getting, cutting that corporate income tax was a good thing. It increased the value of my retirement accounts by about 20% with the stock market going up um, by that amount due to, just as theory predicted. By the way, this little recession we had recently most of the world did not experience much of a recession, not the Far East. They had tiny little blips. And people always worry about the great deflation causing the problem. That's not the problem of the, the Great Depression in the U.S. Um, there were bigger, as Christine Romer showed, there's bigger drops in the price level in 2021. And yet hardly any real effects in the U.S. Um, a little drop in rapid recovery. So, <coughs> something else is going on. Um, that there's no relationship between these sort of essentially financial crises. Sometimes they do, there's reforms, sometimes they're good. Economy does great, and sometimes they're bad. Economy does terrible. All the Scandinavian economies went bankrupt in about 1991. Um, they reformed and prospered. Japan had a similar problem. They did not reform. They had their zombie banks. They let, they, the government told them the banks to lend to the uh, businesses who couldn't make payments. So they could make payments. They wouldn't have to be declared bankrupt. <laughs> 
Spain doesn't do any stupid stuff like that, I'm sure. They're, they're much, uh, sort of, the, seems, economically seem to be the bright spot in uh, Europe, which is good to see. Uh, but I'd like to see uh, other parts doing well. Scandinavia has done quite well. Um, and they were not hit by the uh, big, uh, the real economic activities. Things like flexible labor markets are so important. And where do you look for that? You look for Denmark. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's where people, people are freer to now get together and set up an enterprise. I see all this trade stuff as just uh, rhetoric uh, in every president uh, just about, uh, there were voluntary quotas back in 1981, told the Japanese not to imp limiting the number, and there was another voluntary quotas in the uh, mid-90s for the high-end auto Japanese automobiles. But well, they got around that. The people down in Kentucky, the industrial center, that's the hillbillies land. That's where uh, they set up, Toyota set up their factory, and, and most of the value added is American workers and suppliers, uh, local suppliers. They had the technology, the know-how that's so important. So it's, it gets, things, and, and I spend a lot of connection with uh, China. Uh, in, I'm just fascinated in it, with the dramatic change and progress they're making. And President Xi and, is pretty smart, and he cares about the American people. I mean, the Chinese people. Uh, <laughs> and, and indirectly, the American people. <laughs> and I think Trump is, cares about the American people, and, but they have their tough problems, and there's big gains from uh, coming to agreement, and they're coming to agreement, and anybody that's worried about trade wars or don't. <laughs> they're, that's just part of the political rhetoric. Uh, so I'm optimistic about the future with the um, rapid technology change in advance. I don't think we can measure how fast it is. We can't measure growth rate. We can measure comparative levels. And, and theory keeps working over and over again, like the stock market went up by the right amount that's predicted in a McGrath in my 2009 paper. Uh, it, the, this, the, given the real shocks, the, this little recent recession we had uh, in 2008, I think it was, uh, was unfortunate and should, with better well, some things hadn't been done differently, but there was a combination of factors that led to that. And they weren't monetary. Um, so, oh, one other really good thing, I think, in the U.S. is now we have a little independence of the Fed with uh, Powell being the chairman. And that's good. There should be conflict between the uh, monetary and fiscal th authorities. In the... Generally, in the past, the chairman of the Fed was bored of, was just, uh, did what the president told him. Uh, they were not independents. Uh, about the only exception was William McChesney Martin, with some clever moves, was able to get some independence. But the, it's a check and a balance between these two, and checks and balances are crucial to a well-functioning steady, stable political system. That completes what I have to say. Okay, now we have some time for, for questions. Um, who... Hello. 
first of all, thank you. Uh, I think it was uh, very useful uh, uh, that you highlight what you think has changed in all these economic ambits. Uh, my question is uh, for Professor Ann Kruger. Uh, I want to say that I do agree that international uh, trade has been key to global growth. It has been key also to this trade, uh, to this war uh, decreasing. So it has been key to democracy. And I think that US, I think that made or improved uh, uh, these trade, relations, uh, trade relationships with countries after World War exactly because of that, because they believe that it was key for these both things. And I do agree also that Trump, uh, uh, I would say that it's a little bit maybe insane on what he says and what he does. But sometimes I want to put a little bit of sense on what he does or, and what he says. And uh, I want to know your opinion about, uh, about uh, what he says about uh, dumping, this Chinese, uh, Chinese doing dumping on trade. Uh, this uh, uh, Chinese stealing uh, information and technology or this tra transfer technology. Is there true about that? Is there something that it's true uh, about this uh, Chinese government helping Chinese uh, firms acquiring uh, large uh, US firms? Is there, is, is there something that it's true about that? Is it that big? Is it that important? And uh, has the World Trade Organization uh, been, do, been doing enough in, in all these matters. So, you know, when he says these things and then the Chinese government announced last week that they, uh, they are going to do a law regarding this uh, transfer of technology, that they are going to forbid this. I don't know if it's because it, it's, uh, this was happening or it's because, okay, they want to, to, to say, okay, Trump, we are going to do something about that uh, in, in order to de-escalate these uh, this trade tensions that we have. Thank you. Okay, good question. Uh, <laughs> how long do I have to answer? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> let me start with something and just say one thing. And that, for, first off, in the 1980s, as you know, Japan was growing quite rapidly and developing in good ways and so on and so forth. And I swear that if I still had taken the clippings from that time about how the Japanese were terrible and how they were stealing American technology and all that, and if I could took them and struck out the word Japan and put in the word China, I think it's exactly the same kinds of statements. So that doesn't prove it's wrong this time, but it does make it somewhat suspicious. Uh, President Xi didn't announce this uh, program to have these 25 industries by 2025. And of course, he expects to do all that with state enterprises. To which my reaction is, if the United States is really worried about Chinese growing so rapidly and all that, the best thing to do would be to encourage him. We have seen over and over again that when countries try and pick winners, they do a very bad job, uh, and there's almost no exception. The Soviet Union did put enough into the military complex that it could do one thing better than most others, but at the co huge cost to everything else. It's not my, not, from what I know, I don't think the Chinese can afford that kind of specialization and the costs that it would impose on the rest of society. If the United States is worried about transfer technology, well, for, second, on transfer technology, the first thing is I have been to, on a couple of boards of directors of high-tech companies, and they do go to ex expositions, and they do show their stuff. When they do that, they never, ever show their stuff without at least two employees of the company being right there to make sure these guys can't take pictures and take too much from it. Everybody's trying to steal from everybody else, and it's well known that that's the case. So the first thing is that industrial espionage is not unique to anybody anywhere, and it's not unique to governments. But having said that, uh, the second thing is that the, the allegation is that the Chinese are doing it by requiring this of joint ventures. The simple US answer, if they really are concerned about that, is pass a law and say no US company may engage in a joint venture. Then they can take 100% ownership, or they can do industrial licensing, or they can take royalties. They don't have to have ownership. <clears throat> so I don't quite think, quite buy that argument. I've, obviously, there are anecdotes, and there are times when it's true. There's absolutely no doubt. But I also know of American companies that have stolen from other American companies. I know of Indian companies that have stolen from American, and vice versa. Uh, no, nobody's as innocent in this game as the Americans claim, and it's probably not as widespread as is stated either. Now, any growing country is going to be behind the one with the technological lead, which the U.S. is, in which case it's going to be our technology, as long as we're ahead, 
uh, that is what are the targets for industrial espionage. There's no doubt about that. But not only that, if they're going to catch up, they're going to do it anyway. They can buy products, they can reverse engineer them, they can do all kinds of other things, and they will. And my, my response, if I could persuade anybody in the United States, would be, to, okay, we concentrate on getting a better set of incentives for innovation, for development, and the kind of incentives that will make our own growth more productive and raise that productivity growth rate and so on. So I think you're partially right. Namely, there is a source of concern, but the answer to that is to make sure your own economy is more healthy and only secondarily to say, hey, they're stealing from us. Thank you. More questions? Please. I, I want to ask you something too, Matthew. Uh, you ended your, your talk uh, talking about incentives, but you didn't say which incentives were, were uh, you know, useful for, for this problem, which I think is a, is a critical problem of information, news, and do you have, a, you, can you speculate a little bit, or you have some ideas of how these incentives should be, uh, you know, uh, approach, how, how do you approach this, this kind of problem? Are you thinking about regulation, or, because the market doesn't seem to be, to provide the, the right incentives? The others probably have other answers, and I'd be interested in hearing them. But I think about it as being a level playing field among private economic activities. Uh, that you, yes, you do get better infrastructure. Yes, you do have a good communications and what have you system. But you do not differentiate between the production of a widget, the production of a pancake, and the production of a telephone. Uh, those are things where let the private market decide that within the context of the, within the context of what the framework is. Now that is only a partial answer because, of course, defining that framework is important and you can over-regulate and under-regulate, and at least in my view, some of the problems many countries have is when they have too much intervention in many of the markets that the companies need to use, labor market, for example. In India, to take a prime example, the land market is regulated to death, practically. And the result is, that, well, remember, Tata's wanted to do the nano car. They couldn't do it because they could not acquire the land. Uh, and land is a big problem there, as is labor. And getting rid of some of these, what I would call superfluous regulations, or what, re regulations that do more harm than good might be a better word, uh, would be a desirable thing. On the other hand, to have no regulation is also silly. Law and order is, in the sense, of regulation. Just to say a little bit, I think, I think one thing that's tricky in the issue with reposting of news is that the property rights are not so clearly defined. And if one wants to think carefully about regulation, I think that, that we, you know, intellectual property rights for content uh, haven't been updated in a long time. And, it's, and the, the current environment is allowing for a much faster dissemination of information and copying of it. And it's not completely obvious how one fixes that, but I, I think that, that the, the, the part of the key is, is knowing who owns what and when, and, and now that's, the, the lines have been blurred greatly in that, and that, that's sort of a tricky, a, a tricky area to regulate, but I think that that would be the place to start. Thank you. Come on. Thank you. I wanted to thank all of you, because when we first talked with Therese about having a, a round table of people talking about different peoples, different things, so that might be a little dangerous. But at the end, you all talk about the same thing, which is let's get down to fundamentals and not get fooled by rhetoric. And is the rhetoric and the words than a square trash theory, not words. So in a different ways, uh, we had been all talking about the same. So thanks a lot. But given that, I just have a question on this. To, uh, to, Bob Lucas, in particular, and also Ed, you said, well, and it was very good, you talk not for what I ask you to talk, when you talk about this development of economics and the growth of professional economists and the role we play some. And but I think you told me once, because we were talking long-term growth and all that stuff, and then you were looking at these pictures like that, and you said to me, well, but a lot of jobs are not looking at the little, little things in the money and finance and all that stuff. We have all these economies working in central banks and something. What should we do to them, to tell them? <laughs> That's not a, I, I, I can't. <laughs> I thought you were signing off now. 
I'm sorry. What were you? you, you, you what was Once you get the fundamentals, the things are simple, as you said. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> he also said to me once, we also get paid for looking at the small movements and the small things that uh, and a lot of our colleagues in central banks do. I, should I we was... tell them to stop or should we keep them with the jobs? <laughs> I'm just thinking about it. Economists used to be, they were teachers. You go to school and you get the little the kids and tell them what, whether they're right or wrong. And I had high college... Uh, uh, and, and now it's just totally different. Everybody in Chicago, when I got my, 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 my uh, first degree, well, it's, it's, uh, there were five people in, in, the, in, the, in the economy in Chicago who, who were listed as, as economists. I mean, that was, that was their profession, you know? Now, two-thirds of the economy is professed. Now, a lot of these guys are going into business and... There's a lot of things you can do with the, with the economic training, so it's just it's just spreading out in, in, into a much different uh, episode than it was when we were just college professors. Period. Uh, no, so I, I, I've just, that's that's me. I I stayed with that, but 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 people are going a lot of, into a lot of different directions, and I think it's 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 good. <laughs> Hello, um, I think my question is more appropriate for Edward. Um, I want to th uh, ask, um, what are the current beliefs or more ex expectations about the uh, economic cycles? Are it going to disappear or maybe change in some way? I don't uh, know. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I must have missed a couple words. Uh, could you repeat? Yes, um, what are the current expectations or beliefs about the business cycles in the future? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, on the business cycle, it's, I call them the Lucas business cycles because he's the one that uh, defined that in recurrent fluctuations of output and employment about trend. These are little fluctuations. I've gotten more interested in the big <laughs> expansions and periods of depression and periods of booms. Um, we know that one question, what's going to happen in China? Where are they going to ask me to, to relative to, uh, say, Western Europe and Japan and thing? Um, theory doesn't say. There's, if you're far away from uh, the, the growth, you, there's sort of a limit on how fast you're growing and being further away doesn't change things. Um, with the, on the other hand, with business cycles, you're within, say, 5 or 6% of that growth path. And you takes about uh, six, uh, uh, six quarters of a year to year and a half to close half the gap. Uh, that says that the, and the U.S. has begun closing that coming up to a new higher or, or balanced growth path that is closer to its pre-2008 trend. Um, there was a period of depression in the U.S. that lasted about seven years, it'd be about 12 percent, uh, half productivity, half changes in the nature of the labor laws and regulations um, that lowered hours work per working age person in the business sector. Um, but, but now things have, um, are coming back since, which is good to see. Uh, but it's, that won't continue. It's, you close half the gap in you know, six quarters, and you're 6% that you have an extra growth of 3% in that first period, but the next period it's one and a half percent, only half the amount, and then it's only three quarters of a percent. But I see there's no recession coming. Um, 
unless there is a, there could be a policy regime change, but I doubt it, that that will occur. The U.S. is pretty heterogeneous and pretty, lots of checks and balances and can keep on a steady path, <laughs> relatively. Um, thank you very much to all of you. I had a question for Professor Ashenfelter. Um, so related to automation, um, it does seem to have an effect on, and you, you mentioned this uh, actually, then, on the types of jobs, the, where do, uh, the, the distribution of jobs positions at least. And I, I would like to know your opinion about uh, low skilled workers. Where do you see low-skilled workers? Uh, in which sectors do you think they will tend to focus uh, uh, after automation uh, becomes bigger? Uh, I guess in manufacturing, automation has been there for a long time, and I, and I, I completely agree with your view that it, the, the effect of recent changes don't have a major impact. But uh, in services, maybe this, the, the effect it becomes uh, more salient. So do you see a specific sector with low skilled workers can, can concentrate on? And in particular, I'm concerned because low skilled workers seem to be upset in, in many countries and this ends up affecting uh, political results and end up affecting view on migration. So I think it's particularly interesting to understand where uh, these type of workers are gonna concentrate. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, what you're referring to is what some people call the uh, the hollowing out of the uh, of the middle of the wage distribution. Uh, that that isn't really true. I mean, if you look at the wage distribution, it still has a big looks like a normal curve uh, in logarithms. But um, there is clearly an increase in uh, personal income inequality and and wage inequality. Um, and there's been lots of discussion about what's involved in that. Some of it, you can trace the institutional factors. <clears throat> some of it, uh, some people at least, have traced to um, automation, the way you described it. Um, I have difficulty with that, believing that's really the key factor. The only reason I say that is because um, there's been automation everywhere uh, there has been some increase in inequality in, in, in most of the developed countries, uh, which didn't appear actually until fairly recently, but nothing like the increase that took place in both Britain and, and the U.S. So it's kind of hard to explain why would robots matter so much in one place and not another. I think it's, uh, uh, it's probably not the key factor, but it's certainly one that people have discussed because um, the, uh, there, there's just a general, uh, I have uh, colleagues, in fact, who have just written this book, be out next year, called Deaths of Desperation and uh, the Future of Capitalism. Um, and the concern really is with, um, in the U.S. especially, uh, is with people who seem to be uh, would have at one future in the past maybe uh, have sort of had a, uh, a more uh, a happier existence as a mere blue collar workers. Um, and that, that for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, um, the, uh, this hasn't been mentioned here, but it's probably the biggest single issue in the US right now. Um, there's, there's uh, actual, for the first time ever, an increase in, in uh, instead of decreased mortality, is increased mortality for, especially white, uh, uh, high school graduates in the U.S., high school and less. Um, and the scale of it is, is, some of it is pretty remarkable. I, mean, I used to always use 100. Uh, you know, you always hear about uh, there's a terrorist blew up three people in Syria. Uh, now you have to always have the perspective. What, what, is that a lot of people? Well, let me give you my standard, is 100. 
100 people die on roads in car accidents in the U.S. every day. It's about 30 to 40,000 people. So I always thought that was a, that's a big number, 100 a day. If it's a terrorist attack does more than 100, I pay attention. Less than 100, I could, I could look up the people that died in the U.S. that day and tell you how many there were. So 100 I used to use. Well, the new one is 200. That's the opioid deaths. There are actually more opioid deaths per day than there are car crashes that kill people in the U.S. It's pretty amazing, uh, especially since uh, it went from being virtually nothing. And uh, there's not really any sign. Everybody calls it a crisis, but there's not much being done about it. So I think what you're really driving at is there's a group, there's some people who clearly have not uh, who may, maybe in the past, we think, might have been um, in a better economic position, uh, at least in the distribution of incomes. It doesn't mean that their level of income is so much lower. But there seem to be other uh, social phenomena associated with that that are kind of depressing. Um, and uh, I don't think anybody has a very clear um, I mean, there are public policies that could have been engaged in that we didn't engage in. And then, and then uh, an epidemic is where, you know, if you stop it early, you're fine. Uh, we had that with the SARS epidemic. We actually, the Chinese and the Canadians and so on were very helpful and we tamped it down right away and it didn't become an epidemic. Uh, it's a little bit too late with, uh, I'm afraid, with opioids and I'm not quite sure how well, that's going to end. But I think what you're describing are, are this is, the, and I don't think it has anything to do with the robots, really. Uh, it has to do probably to some extent with the decline of unionization. Uh, truck drivers used to have good jobs. They had a strong union, got paid a lot. It's now a terrible job. Uh, they're not paid very much. So there are people that would have had jobs like that. They're, they're not going to have jobs like that. They're gone. Um, so there is some, but I don't think it has to do with robots. Uh, that, the big new thing, and to take truck driving as an example, just to end the point, it, of course, is that people are talking about driverless trucks. Actually, I would think that would be, if, they, if you could do that safely, it would be great. It's such a crummy job. <laughs> my, always, my favorite story is about my, my brother-in-law, who, who had, toward the end of his life, was driving a truck, and he had a dog that went with him. And I'll never forget the last time I saw him, truck, he gave up truck driving, by the way. What, he was, he, it was time for the truck to leave, and he called for his dog. And the dog wouldn't come. <laughs> the dog knew better than to jump in the truck, because it was going to be a long way and not very much fun. Uh, so I, 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 I think that's what you're referring to. We don't, I, I don't have much to say about that, but I don't think automation is really a... Uh, an explanation for it. There are too many other very good explanations. And it's a relatively small, it's not a large group, but it's a, it's a very depressing idea that there are people like that, that, that we've had this increased inequality and then it's, it's, uh, at some level you could see it in areas where you wouldn't ever expect it. And mortality is an example. Okay. I should add, by the way, the book, I, I, I have seen a draft, it's a... Uh, depressingly thin on solutions. Okay. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much, all of you again, for uh, sharing with us your knowledge and your ideas. And uh, we go out for uh, some lunch. Okay?